Rocket League. Man, what can I say? Even before today, it's been like watching a slow motion dumpster fire from day one. First, there was Intel's curb stomping by Zen 3 last year. Then, because of a totally broken roadmap, they admitted to being forced to use a bizarre mashup of a 2019 microarchitecture with an ancient 40 nanometer manufacturing process. Not only that, but because of excess heat and power, Intel's flagship CPU, the i9-11900K, is back to an eight core layout. It just doesn't make any sense. Oh, and then there are some retailers that ended up showing Intel their middle finger and started selling these things a few weeks ago. <sighs> what a disaster. But it might not be all that bad news though. While Intel might be looking really weak with their Core i9 and Core i7 range, I actually want to focus this video on the i5-11600K. It's a lot more affordable and it sticks to the 6-core 12 thread design and availability should be much better. So there's a real chance that it could put out some of that dumpster fire. Maybe. I mean, look, the Rocket Lake architecture does show some flashes of really good improvements on the Core i9-11900K, so much so that it can beat the 5900X in a bunch of real-world applications. But when it comes to real-world multi-core workloads, it just gets beaten like a lazy donkey, even by the 10900K. Its insane $600 street price is even harder to justify in gaming, where results are all over the place, and it gets owned by AMD in esports titles as well. And yeah, there's gonna be times where the older 10900K comes out on top as well. Now, does this look like a $600 processor? Absolutely not. But maybe retailers are hoping that people will buy anything these days, since Ryzen 5000 series are just still very difficult to buy. Now, all the negative coverage of the 1100K might make you think Intel's entire lineup is a failure, but it really isn't, which is exactly why I think the 11600K is so important. But how about talking about a product lineup that's full of awesomeness, and that's Keoxia's SSDs, which have been created from the ground up for any task you can throw at them. They have NVMe SSDs for high-performance gaming PCs, all the way up to drives created for hyperscale and enterprise data centers. By using the super versatile BiCS flash technology, every one of these is perfectly suited for the environments with a focus of combining performance and lasting endurance. For more information about Keoxia and their drives, make sure to check the link down below. All right, to set the stage, let's take a quick look at Intel's new i5, i7, and i9 K-series lineup, along with the approximate street prices we've seen so far. And you can already see why the 1100K is in a bit of a tough position. While it generally has higher clock speeds than the 11700K, the core count is identical, and like I said, a huge step back from the 1000K. Meanwhile, the other two K-series chips fare just a bit better since they have been cut down a lot. The main problem is pricing, guys. But then again, when hasn't that been an issue for Intel? You see, because of AMD's Ryzen 5000 series spanking them so hard, Intel had to drastically cut the costs for the 10700K, and especially the 10900K. That means a massive gap between the current and new CPUs. Remember those results I showed you at the beginning of this video? Yeah, that's an extra $170 Intel's asking for, which makes the 1100K a complete waste of money. But the new i5-11600K is still close up to the 10600K's current price because it has the same number of cores and the new Cypress Core architecture, which should bring some pretty good performance uplifts. Now, I may as well talk about this new architecture. Uh, Cypress Cove is Intel's first new core design for desktops since Skylake was released almost six years ago. Now, to create it, Intel took the 10 nanometer Sunny Core architecture we've seen on laptop Ice Lake chips and then backported it to their 40 nanometer manufacturing process. On the positive side, it finally allows Intel to move towards something other than an evolved half decade old design. But, and this is important, Sunny Cove was a bit of a disaster on the performance side, which is why Intel moved so quickly to the Velo Cove design last year. So with this new architecture spicing things up, is there anything else that needs to be excited about? Well, I think the biggest changes have been, you know, the new native PCI Gen 4 for storage and discrete GPUs, Thunderbolt 4 is here, and then updated iGPU that uses Intel's new XE graphics engine, and uh, that's pretty much it. Now, looking at how the i9-1100K lines up with the 5900X makes it super evident why Intel needs a reality check. If you can actually find one, the AMD processor can deliver more cores, more performance, and lower power levels for less money. But AMD's main problem is that they can't seem to produce enough of these, so if Intel can jump with actual stock, 
they might actually win by default. This is exactly why we think the 11600K could be a real gem. It costs less than the 5600X, still offers 12 threads, and our retail contacts tell us that it'll be mostly widely available as well. Now, while Intel has worked really hard to make all these CPUs appear different, they're actually identical in one big way. Every Rocket Lake S chip comes with the same eight core dime with two cores disabled for the six core models. Four core models stick to Comet Lake architecture. So that means that every one of them has the same huge die. We know the die is huge because user Mopen on overclock.net forums deleted his i7-11700K and well, it's very, very big or about 33% larger than the 10 core i9-10900K Comet Lake die and over 50% bigger than the eight core i9-9900K. Now all of that space and Intel's failure to move past the 14 nanometer manufacturing process should lead to some higher power consumption and heat output, right? Well, we actually found something really interesting while testing the i5-11600K. You see, Intel's long duration PL1 and short term PL2 ratings are pretty well known and we're seeing them here with the 11600K hitting nearly 160 watts for 80 seconds during an all core load. It then falls to Intel's 125 watt spec. And that's a whole lot more than the 10600K and in an other world versus the 5600X. With a Noctua U12S running at 75% fan speed, the 11600K's temperature does increase, but it cuts down to more manageable levels over the long run. It's only five degrees hotter than the 5600X, which isn't all that bad when you consider the rumors that had these chips putting out gobs of heat. So this one's interesting, guys. Even though it consumes a lot more power and produces more heat than the 10600K, the new Rocket Lake CPU actually levels out at much lower all-core frequencies. And that short frequency spike at the beginning of the test is meant to make Intel CPUs look much better in shorter synthetic benchmarks. And obviously that has no impact on longer renders. So before moving on to benchmarks, I need to mention that we're sticking to mostly real world testing with workloads that have been submitted by people who work with these applications on a daily basis. The only synthetic benchmarks we use is Cinebench and these multi-core tests show a really, really impressive improvement over the previous generation. And it could be due to the 10600K's boost for a shorter period of time, even then, Intel still has some catching up to do versus AMD. Now, when it comes to single core performance, Rocket Lake's Cypress Cove cores are well designed for single core workloads, but Zen 3 dominates here too. Moving on to actual real world use cases and the i5-11600K starts off really strong. I should also mention Premiere's latest update doesn't use Intel's graphics anymore, but rather pushes the Nvidia GPU to do all the encoding, and decoding. Meanwhile, programs like Reality Capture and Metashave use a combination of lightly and heavily threaded workloads to process scenes. They show the 11600K to be really well positioned against the 5600X. As a matter of fact, Intel runs away with this sometimes. Our Mozilla compiler test shows that Intel's actually been able to coax a good amount of improvement from Rocket Lake, and that's all it took to beat AMD by a narrow margin. Now, what really surprised me was even in heavy multi-threaded situations, the 11600K ended up being competitive, all while running at lower speeds than the 10600K. Now remember, this CPU actually costs less than the 5600X, and in most situations, it either matches or beats it. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, this might be the gem in Intel's lineup right now. But what about gaming performance? Well, that's a tough one, guys, because the i5-11600K is all over the place. It does give some tangible benefits over the previous generation, which is a good thing, but the Ryzen 5 5600X is able to stay pretty far out front in some cases. There are two huge concerns for Intel. First of all, the benefits of Rocket Lake we saw in productivity are nowhere to be seen here. And secondly, AMD just clobbers them in some popular competitive shooters. Now moving on to overclocking, and I need to mention that Rocket Lake's clock speeds have come down a little bit compared to the previous generation. And also just keep in mind that voltages have gone up. Now, the great thing about Intel's amazing 14 nanometer process is that it's really durable and resistant to damage from voltage. The bad news is that it really needs a lot of it <laughs> to hit higher clock speeds, especially with this new architecture. And given how Intel's so desperate to close the gap to AMD's Ryzen 5000 series, it should come as no surprise that Intel's pushing these new processors to the limit, right out of the factory. And that means uh, tons of voltage is being pumped through them. To prove that, here are the stock voltage and frequency curves Intel programmed. And you can see that once you reach 4.8 gigahertz, 
you need a lot of voltage. And if you want to reach 5 gigahertz on something like the 11900K, you will need a lot more. So far in our testing, it seems like most Rocket Lake processors will be able to hit 5.1 gigahertz. On some chips, that's going to be only one or two cores, like on our i5 11600K. Let's take a closer look at the CPU overclock. So with 1.34 volts, it can run at 5.1 gigahertz on two cores for lightly threaded applications, 5 gigahertz on three cores, 4.9 gigahertz on up to five cores, and then 4.8 gigahertz on all cores for fully multi-threaded applications. That's only a 200 megahertz overclock, and it was able to push the power package from 125 watts to 192 watts. Uh, temperatures went all the way up to 89 degrees Celsius in Autodesk Maya, and we were using the Noctua U12S with two fans running at full speed. Look, you're gonna need an excellent cooling solution to keep this chip running under 90 degrees Celsius when it's overclocked. Now, we're gonna get into more detail about overclocking and memory tweaking and all that stuff in an upcoming video. But here's a little teaser, so stay tuned for that. So I guess that pretty much wraps things up with the i5 11600K. And well, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this one uh, because they're a lot more positive than the 11900K. While that processor is overpriced, underperforming, and just an all-around dumpster fire, I think the 11600K is a pretty decent chip. It improves big time over the 10600K, and it either equals or beats the Ryzen 5 5600X in a lot of apps while costing a lot less. It's a great all-around option that shouldn't have any supply issues that unfortunately AMD is facing right now with their Ryzen 5000 series of processors, so that's nice. The problem is with gaming. You see, I never thought I'd say this, but Intel actually still needs to work on their gaming performance, especially when it comes to competitive shooters. Now, in new AAA games that are GP bottleneck, the 11600K is just as good as the 5600X. But move to something like Rainbow Six, Valorant, and CSGO, and the tires just fall right off. Those aren't unpopular like Tomb Raider, Hitman, and other games that everyone else loves benchmarking because those titles host tens, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of concurrent users. AMD found a secret sauce for them, and now Intel needs to pull up their pants and work really fast. Either way, given its price, I'd say the 11600K is a great alternative to the 5600X in almost every situation, and I'm just gonna hope that it stays in stock long enough for people to actually buy one. So on that note, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, and... Uh, Spend responsibly, my friends.